else to offer, and I am saying puzzle very loosely. The other kind of puzzles in this game usually revolve around ropes. Last of Us 1 had a dozen ladder puzzles, and this one decided to shake things up. Sorry ladders, ropes are my new best friends. But ropes aren't as prevalent as the ladders, and they aren't really as annoying, mostly because the ropes are used differently every time. You can get kind of creative with how you use them, and the rope physics kind of stop the puzzles from being annoying. Now while the puzzles aren't really a deal breaker for me, the one thing that got really annoying was the level design. This game has much bigger environments than the first game, and honestly, it's kind of overwhelming a lot of the time. There are a lot of situations where you'll get disoriented and lost and have no idea where to go. For the most part, they try to block off areas that you can't traverse with like vines and shit, but it's still really hard to tell where the game wants you to go. And yes, you can turn on a waypoint setting that'll tell you where to go, but that's not really an excuse. If the developers added that setting knowing that you're gonna get lost sometimes, then it's on them to just make the layout of these areas less confusing. I think in every wide open area, I got confused at least once. I'm either really stupid or the levels are confusing, and since I refuse to accept any of my mistakes, I'm gonna go ahead and blame the video game this time. Now between the exploration there are combat segments, and this is where the game really saved itself for me. To put it simply, murder never felt so good. Now when I started playing the game, I was playing on the medium difficulty because I wanted to beat the game fast and get this review out, but I got really bored. So I turned the difficulty up to the highest setting and it was like night and day. Before I could just run and gun like I was playing Doom and there was no tension whatsoever, but the highest difficulty really feels like the true Last of Us experience. Ellie dies so fucking fast and ammo is so scarce that you really have to use every tool at your disposal to survive. Bottles become more valuable as they're more common than ammo and they can net you a kill if you use them right. The game seriously turns into Metal Gear Solid on this difficulty. I'm one of the few people who like when stealth is done well in video games and the stealth in this game is really good. The enemy AI makes things super unpredictable too. Sometimes an enemy will cry out if you jump at them with an axe and sometimes they don't. You may do the exact same route the exact same way but sometimes the AI is just gonna do something completely different and that's kinda cool. They really do feel more unique because they act like real people. If you shoot from a hiding spot they'll call out the exact place you shot from. People clown on the fact that the NPCs shout each other's names, but I actually kind of like it. It adds another level of realism, and other games have done it before. However, I think it is really silly that there are only like 10 enemy character models. If you're gonna painstakingly name every NPC, at least make them look different. But anyway, once a fight does break out, the gunplay is explosive and heavy hitting. The guns really feel good in this game, and it felt like I was actually in a life or death gunfight. Whenever I saw a group of humans, I got super excited to try and find an ideal route for taking everybody out while conserving as much ammo as possible. I used the guns so infrequently that it felt really good whenever I was left with no choice but to tap into my ammo and just go crazy on people. However, the zombie fights were still kind of hit or miss for me, even on the higher difficulty. Their AI is kind of bad, and yeah, I get they're zombies, but most of the time you don't have to think too hard to get past them. And while I got really excited for each encounter with the humans, I felt equal amounts of dread whenever I heard zombies nearby. However, the one fun thing is that if you're good enough, you can just melee the zombies and save some ammo. There's even this mini boss that I had to fight later on, and I didn't really have any ammo to spare, so I found out that I could just beat the shit out of him with my bare hands as long as I dodged his counterattacks. That was pretty fun, I was actually glad that I got to do that. But I still wish that there were less zombies and more humans, which is sad because this is a zombie game. Now maybe I'm a masochist, but I actually really did enjoy restarting whenever I didn't nail my run the way I wanted to. Whenever I made it through an area but I ended up using way too much ammo, I ended up restarting because I kinda had to. You only got one bullet every once in a while. Personally, this is how I like playing games, but if this isn't for you, then don't play on the highest difficulty. It's just gonna hurt your feelings. If I was scoring the combat on its own, I would say on the hardest difficulty, I got like an 8 out of 10 experience out of that. But on medium, I was bored out of my fucking mind and it was not an experience that I would like to relive. I understand that not everybody is a masochistic gamer like me and some people just want to get through the story and they don't care about the gameplay that much. But I played it on the hardest difficulty and I really only liked it because I was on the hardest difficulty so I think that's worth noting. So anyway, now we gotta talk about the real meat and potatoes of this game the story, and you can't do that without spoiling, so I'm gonna spoil the game now, okay? That's your warning, don't yell at me, I'm gonna spoil it, let's go. Honestly, the story of this game is a mixed bag, and that's putting it lightly. 
There are aspects of this story that I absolutely love, and there are a lot of things that left me baffled. Truly and utterly baffled on why they chose to do things the way that they did them. But my annoyance is mostly at the fact that people are mad at the wrong things in this game. A lot of people are just mad at the fact that Joel dies. I had so many people in my chat who were angry that Joel doesn't get a redemption arc, which isn't even really all that true because he does admit his lie to Ellie and they do talk about it a little bit. But people really genuinely think that Joel was the hero of the first game. People played that game and watched the ending and thought to themselves, wow, Joel saved his daughter from those bad doctors. What a hero. I had people in my chat saying that his death was unfair because they brutally murdered, and I quote, a beloved character. Joel is not a fucking beloved character. Winnie the Pooh is a beloved character. Joel is a violent anti-hero. There are scenes in the first game where he murders people just because he wants to. I think a lot of people wrongfully believe that this is a story about how you have to protect your loved ones no matter the cost. Joel saves Ellie because he desperately does not want to lose another daughter. There is no point where he grapples with the morality of his choice. He wants to save Ellie, he does not care about curing humanity. This is a sad ending, and not because humanity is doomed, but because we spend the whole game watching these two learn to care for each other, and bantering, and joking, and sharing personal heartwarming experiences with each other. And now, that's ruined forever. Welcome Ellie home, knows in her heart that Joel is not telling the whole truth, and that he lied to her face even though she told him not to. And because of that, she can never really forgive him again. There's virtually nothing heroic in this story at all, and yet people still see Joel as a hero. If Ellie had it her way, she would have died, because at this point, she is not a selfish person. From her perspective, Joel took the choice away from her. And now, this story explores how Ellie takes on Joel's traits. The game opens with her learning how to play guitar like he does. And then we also see her become more comfortable with killing like he was. We see her exacting her revenge in the same way as him, except it takes a toll on her. I personally love this shit, and I love how Joel's death has consequences for every character. It's handled wonderfully. But people are mad. They're mad because you don't kill Abby and get revenge in the end, and I cannot understand that at all. At the end of the game, our two protagonists have this crazy final battle, and as Ellie is drowning Abby, she flashes to an image of Joel. And at first I thought this was just some cliche way to remind us that, oh no, Joel wouldn't want Ellie to do this. But later, we see that she was actually flashing back to a very specific scene where Joel and her are talking about forgiveness. And I would say that that's the theme of the game. Ellie has to learn how to forgive Joel for what he did, and then she has to learn how to forgive Abby. So no, this is not a story about revenge. It is a story about forgiveness, which is much more interesting to me. If you got to this scene and you thought that the best narrative choice is for Ellie to kill Abby, then I truly cannot fathom how you consume stories. Because to me, this was never a revenge story. I never saw it that way. Ellie and Abby both suffer immensely for the things they've done wrong. Abby takes revenge on Joel and it causes all of her friends to die. Then she's tortured and enslaved for months and literally crucified. When Ellie starts trying to get revenge, it ends with her having absolutely nothing. She's left with no one. And I really like how both of these stories mirror Joel's adventure in the last game. For instance, Joel makes a selfish choice in the first game and it damages his relationship with Ellie forever. At the end of this game, Ellie makes a selfish choice by leaving Dina to try and go get revenge, but it damages her relationship with her forever. This is the level of storytelling that I want from this series. I love shit like this. I love having strong themes that permeate throughout the whole story. I remember when the first game came out and people were furious that you had to kill the doctors and make Joel do the bad thing. But that's the shit that I love. I actually really like that these games don't give us a lot of choice. It is a little heavy handed in some scenes, but this series is not about us, the player. It's about the characters. If Ellie gets attacked by a dog and almost dies, she will kill the dog to survive. You don't get to spare the dog because Ellie wouldn't spare the dog. We as an audience have become far too comfortable with the idea that our choices are the one thing that matter in video games. Some games really benefit from taking choice away from the player to contextualize the character's role in that world. If you were allowed to do a pacifism run of this game, then this scene would be absolutely ridiculous. This is similar to a problem that I have with Metal Gear Solid 5. 
In that game, you are playing as a bad person. However, you can go the whole game without killing anybody. But at the same time, the game is still going to treat you like a bad person. So there's kind of a disconnect. I'm not doing bad things in the gameplay, but the story doesn't really care, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. People are upset that you are forced to do mean things as Ellie, but this is not a nice story, and Ellie's not a nice person. And I have a lot of friends who can't finish the game because it makes them miserable, and I think that's fine. This one is not for everybody. But being mad and furious because a game makes you do evil things is really stupid. The biggest meme about this game right now is, don't you feel bad? And I think this is kind of silly. If you didn't feel bad, then maybe the post-apocalyptic drama narrative isn't doing its job. But this sentiment is also really silly to me because the first game was just as miserable and it also made you do bad shit against your will. It had a lot of moments where Joel was forced to murder. If you think this game is bad because Joel died, then I really want to know how you feel about other stories like this. No Country for Old Men must be a very hard movie for you to watch. And I'm not trying to compare the two. I'm not saying this story is flawless. It has huge problems. There are a ton of things that are actually really stupid in this story, and I don't see anybody talking about any of them. For one, the pacing in this story is fucking awful. Immediately after Joel dies, we ruin all tension by making Ellie and Dina turn on generators and lackadaisically ride their horse around the city looking for treasure. This game does not make a good first impression, and like I said, the opening scenes in this game were not fun to play for me. At this point, I was ready to give the game a 5 out of 10. I really was not having fun. But then things start to pick up a little bit, and I ended up liking it a little more. As Ellie's story kept moving, I was enjoying it more bit by bit. We even have this really cute flashback scene with Joel, which breaks up the scenes of hectic violence. But then this wasn't the only flashback, and with each subsequent flashback, I felt like the story wasn't properly balanced. There's one flashback, which I feel could have really fit better as the intro tutorial of the game. And then there are lots of flashbacks that don't serve any purpose at all. And then things get even worse when we stop playing as Ellie. About halfway through the game, we play as Abby, and we see what she's been doing while Ellie was going on her lesbian murder hobo rampage. And when things first shifted over, I was actually kind of hyped for this. I was excited to see the things that I've done, but in a new context. But that's not what Abby's story is. Abby's story follows a completely different plot that is 100% disconnected from what we experienced as Ellie. A big chunk of the Abby plot is based on finding medicine for this one girl, and then after hours of looking for the fucking medicine, you give it to her, and then she just gets shot by the main villain, and then the main villain of Abby's plot immediately gets shot by the girl that he shot, and then you realize that it just didn't fucking matter anyway. People like to say, oh, well, since Ellie didn't kill Abby, I feel like I wasted my time. No, dude, this is what it feels like to waste the player's time. It'd be one thing if this story was connected to the one that we had been playing for hours, but it's not. I have no idea why these two stories aren't connected in a more cohesive way. For Abby's whole story, she doesn't even know anything about Ellie. And for Ellie's whole story, she doesn't know anything about the crazy jungle cult. This game is divided in half, and the two halves have almost nothing to do with one another. This could have been fixed by ditching this time-hopping shit. Stop doing flashbacks within flashbacks. It's messy and never works out. If this game was laid out chronologically, I think it would have been really cool. Imagine you're playing through a part where you're Abby, and she's hanging out with her friends and talking to them and interacting with them. And then immediately you switch over to Ellie, and you're forced to kill the people we just met and were acquainted with. You play as Abby and you hang out with people, and then you fight them as Ellie to get revenge. As a player, you wouldn't know who's gonna live or die, and there would be a lot more tension. In this game, whenever I saw somebody that we killed as Ellie, I was like, oh yeah, that's the dude we killed. And then I had no further interest in them as characters, because I already knew it was gonna happen to them. As it stands, this game is incapable of making us care about anyone who isn't Ellie or Abby. And a lot of angry gamers don't even like Abby, and I can't even blame them because Abby's half of the story is not fun to play. I can remove large chunks of her story and the overall narrative will be unchanged. I also have no idea why we introduced another faction of evil murderers in the last three hours of the game. These slavery marauders are actually way more interesting than the jungle cult that we fight for most of the game, and if you ask me, they should have just mixed these two factions together to create one threat that carries between Ellie and Abby's stories. This is just another sign of the game feeling really disjointed. So yeah, while I spent most of this video defending the story of this game, it still bothers me a lot. 
I cannot say that I love the whole story in this game. I love parts of it, but there are just as many things that I think do not work. I don't get mad when you kill a main character. I get mad when you waste my time. I get mad when story threads don't matter. And I get mad when I don't care about the side characters, and then they just end up getting killed to shock me. This death is not done for shock value. It motivates the entire plot. A shock value death is one that we forget about immediately. I just hate so much when people call a story bad when it kills a main character. It just doesn't make sense to me, man. It feels like The Last Jedi all over again. There were actual real reasons to not like that movie, but when it first came out, people were just mad because Luke Skywalker dies. Because we can't kill a beloved character. Now, real quick, let's take a second to look at things from a different perspective. Let's go to an alternate universe. The year is 2013, and The Last of Us 1 has just come out. It features a doctor and his daughter in a post-apocalyptic world. The doctor's constantly trying to do the right thing, but the world is decaying so fast, and it's hard for him to recognize right from wrong. Then at the end of the story, he finds a girl who's immune to the virus, but he realizes that he has to kill her to make a cure. And since the world is already looking really bleak, he decides that he has to make the hard choice to sacrifice this girl in order to try to save humanity. It's a tough choice, but he knows that he has to do it because he is one of the last people alive who cares about mankind. But then, that little girl's dad kills him because humanity truly is selfish, and at the end of the day, people don't really want to be saved. Seems like a decent story to me, I could see that being in a video game. But then, a few years pass, and in this alternate universe, The Last of Us Part 2 comes out. And then we have to play as those other people. How dare Naughty Dog make me play as these lunatics? They were clearly the villains of the last game. Dr. Abby's dad was the true hero. He wanted to save the world. They killed my dad, and now they live in this peaceful country town? Are you fucking kidding me? That's not fucking fair. Joel is evil. Why would Naughty Dog try to make me feel bad for killing him? Wait, now I have to play as his daughter? Are you kidding me? She's a psychopath. Do you see how silly that sounds? I didn't even change the story. I just put it in a different order. My point is that people are criticizing this game with the most surface level observations. It's so shallow the way people are talking about this story. I'd say that I enjoyed about 60 to 70% of this game and the rest either bored me out of my fucking mind or made me angry. So as a whole, did this game really justify its existence for me? Yeah, I don't really know. I still personally feel like this story did not really need to continue. I really liked the ending, but the 20 hours leading up to it kind of felt bloated and unsure of itself. I can't just forgive the mountain of dumb shit only because I love the ending, I have to look at the whole picture. I don't really care if you love or hate the game, I'm obviously somewhere in the middle. What I do care about is how people talk about the media that they consume. Because currently the conversations about this game are really not fun to engage with, and I'd like for that to change. But anyway, we have to put a number on this game because number scores are really all some people care about, and scoring this game is kinda tough for me. Part of me wants to give it a 6, and part of me wants to give it a 7. I think about all the stuff I love, but then I remember the stuff that pisses me off. So for now, I'm gonna give The Last of Us Part 2 a 6.5 out of 10. That could probably change if I replayed the game. I might replay it one day, who knows. Bye! Fucking shred, Ellie. I'm playing Rush now. I'm playing Jethro Tull. Much like most video games. You don't have to be convinced to kill in Deathloop. I mean, sure, the game shows you some of the ways how. It tells you how to aim, how to sneak up behind someone, how to kick a dude off a cliff. It introduces you to the huge spectrum of ways you could murder, but it doesn't really need to convince you that you should. This is relatively par for the course for games, and it's not necessarily a criticism. Much like Doom, Hitman, or Devil May Cry, Deathloop is largely a game about process. Tell me the demon is evil, tell me the target is an oil baron, and then let me loose in a playground of death. The method I use to take out these enemies is the game here, not figuring out my motivations why. But 
Unlike any of those games, Deathloop's setting, a time loop, provides a chance to think about the ramifications of kicking a dude off a cliff with slightly more nuance. And, as much as I like the game, the fact that it doesn't take this chance is, I think, a bit of a missed opportunity. I'll get back to that. First, let's talk about why the time loop is cool. A time loop is an inherently video game concept, and you can see that manifest throughout a playthrough of this game. Let's compare Deathloop to Dishonored, for example, another title from the same developer. Dishonored, much like Deathloop, has lots of wacky, off-the-wall ways to kill characters. However, Dishonored put a lot of weight on how the effects of killing people would ripple out into the world. Kill too many people, and rats would start showing up in greater numbers, guards would be more numerous and vigilant, the ending itself would be significantly darker. In Dishonored, the quote-unquote morality with which you completed a level established a sort of internal canon for the game. Your character was either a delicate professional who never killed anyone and slipped through the levels like a shadow, or your character was a complete agent of chaos who did the craziest stunts you've ever seen before plunging his blade into a dude's neck. If you chose one route and then wanted to see what the other felt like, you as a player could restart the game and replay the level, of course, but that's an action outside the fiction of the game. Internally, the character remains consistent. He has no idea that the player who's puppeteering him may have played this level already with a dozen different variations of deadliness. But in Deathloop, the main character, Colt, is living out a day that repeats over and over, which means that Colt's experience and the player's are pretty closely aligned. He learns where each enemy is and the best way to manipulate them at the same time as the player. He retains knowledge just like we do. Colt, just like us, can play the same level as the delicate professional and the agent of chaos, deciding which he prefers at the same time we do. Eventually, for instance, I learned the best way to get across this level was to dart across the rooftops, drop through a window, jump across a hanging plane wing, teleport through these lasers, quietly open the door, and get personal with my assassination target. I learned this through many, many trial and error loops of the same day, which means Colt canonically experienced this day as many times as I did. It was occasionally frustrating, but ultimately very satisfying for me to get the whole sequence right. And I presume Colt, grumpily trying this level over and over again with me, actually felt a similar emotional arc. Frustration leading to satisfaction, us both experiencing the familiar endorphin drip of slowly mastering a system. I expected I would enjoy learning all the parts to the Deathloop ecosystem, but the looping mechanic also led to a surprising phenomenon in my playing experience. I got less careful. My first couple times around the loop, I played extremely slowly, methodically, essentially how I played Dishonored. Aha, I thought I've cracked it. If you creep through the levels, tag every enemy, take each out from range with a silenced pistol, nothing can stop you. How can I get better at the game when I've already mastered it? And I was partially correct. That tactic never stops working. I probably played through the same sequence 20 or more times in Deathloop, and if I wanted, I could have snuck through every time, a shadow that never faces direct conflict. But I eventually came to realize, if I'm going to do this all again, if there are few real consequences for failure, why would I play in a way that's so boring? Going slow and stealthy is a pretty faultless strategy, except who's got the freaking time, man? If I'm gonna be living out this day forever, I'd like to do it in a way more interesting than crouching around corners with a silenced pistol in my hand. It's how my version of Colt, deadened to consequence through dozens of repeated levels, ended up wielding grenades, dual SMGs, and exploding rifles through much of the experience. I sprinted through buildings and leapt from rooftops and had fun doing it in a way I never really got with Dishonored. Through countless repetitions of the same day, Deathloop taught me that self-preservation, minimizing collateral damage, getting in and out unscathed, none of that was really important. As long as you accomplished the goal, who cares about how cleanly you did it? In this way, playing through Deathloop feels like learning to speed run a game. You first learn the rules of the simulation, and then push them until they break. Sometimes, if you aren't familiar enough with the rules, playing like this looks like magic. 
My friend Haley once posted a video of her speed running a level in Hitman 3, and I had to watch it half a dozen times before I fully understood what was happening. She walked in, fired a shot to attract the target's attention, fired again and took him out, popped another guy on a balcony far above, and simply sauntered back out the elevator. The whole thing takes about 16 seconds. It is a bananas, godlike way to complete a level that normally takes far longer, and it's a method only learned through constant repetitions. Sometimes the methods used in speedruns can seem calloused or cruel when described to an outsider. In Bloodborne, you might kill the nothing but helpful doll because leveling up from her corpse is slightly quicker than leveling up from her living body. But when you speedrun a game, you play it dozens and dozens of times, enough repeated loops that the representations of what each mechanic are fade back into their original, impersonal code. To us, embroiled in the world and story of the game, killing the doll might seem monstrous. To them, the game is just a series of puzzles to be solved in the fastest possible way. They know that, for the purposes of a speedrun, the emotional consequences of acting monstrously might as well not exist. When they reset the game and play for an even faster time, the doll won't remember being killed. The second act of most time loop stories is consequenceless living, and it's a pretty fun one. Bill Murray steals a car and drives into a quarry, Andy and Kristen crash a plane and vibe in a pool, Tom Cruise tries to roll under a truck with varying degrees of success. Side note, even though Edge of Tomorrow isn't technically based on a video game, I will die on the hill that is the best video game movie ever made. Anyway, it's very fun to see our characters hurl themselves into the void with reckless abandon, knowing that it won't affect their next day either way. But I think there's a fairly important distinction between any of these events and the violent hedonism of Deathloop, and it's this. Although the characters in these stories frequently off themselves in violent and hilarious ways, the wild abandon with which they treat death largely stays internally focused. In other words, they don't become mass murderers. There are certainly tonal reasons why this is the case. Palm Springs and Groundhog Day are both comedies, Edge of Tomorrow is a motivated thriller. It's hard to imagine any of their pacing and tone being able to withstand a random murder spree. But this is the case because, I think, the stories get that there's a difference between Bill Murray dropping a toaster in his own bathtub and, I don't know, Bill Murray getting more violent than simply punching Ned Ryerson. And I think a major reason we never see our characters, you know, hunt a guy off a cliff, is the understanding that that sort of violence affects who they are as a character. Since these stories always end with a person escaping the time loop, it would be a disturbing endnote to think of our protagonist returning back to ordinary life after a repeating eternity of causing others pain. How would they adjust to treating others with care again when they spent so long without a consequence for their random cruelty? Deathloop, as we've already stated, is a game full to the brim with causing other people pain. Deathloop is a game about making the deadliest, most intricate Rube Goldberg machine of murder you possibly can, learning the system inside and out until you can manipulate it like a marionette, knowing just what strings to pull to cause each part to move. But it's in the ultimate goals that the connection between the character and the gameplay, Colt's motivations and his actions, get a little more strained. Through all the marketing and all the campaign of the game, the message for what you and Colt are trying to do is clear. Break the loop. Find out how to stop living the same day over and over, figure out a way off this island. Our main antagonist is a woman named Juliana, who has the singular goal of stopping him. Colt can't break the loop if Juliana kills him first every single day. And Juliana is perfectly consistent. She lives in the loop, she loves the loop, she knows the loop allows her the foresight of a god and an existence free from meaning. She asks you, isn't this easier? Doesn't the outside world suck? Wouldn't you prefer to just live in this playground of death forever, continue to perfect the sport of hunting each other into infinity? Juliana loves to hunt, and that's what she does and what she is content to do. And through the game, Colt enjoys the same dizzying freedom as Juliana, the same power and deadliness, but unlike her, he, and theoretically we, the player controlling him, are trying to get back to a world where humans aren't just code to be disposed of in the most entertaining way possible. 
which is why I think it's so weird that the beginning of the game already has Colt as a rollicking, murder-go-lucky dude, because what does he want to escape to? Who is Colt if not for this time loop? I have no idea. The only personal expression I've ever seen from him is how creatively he offs people, and I am intensely curious how, if at all, he'd be able to rid himself of the consequenceless mindset he's been in for the past eternity. At the end of Groundhog Day, Murray figures out how to be a good person. At the end of Palm Springs, Sandberg finally understands what's important in life. At the end of Deathloop, you become the absolute peak killing machine you've been training for since the beginning, and then you're done? Just like that? Aside from one relationship level twist I don't love, I don't feel like Colt really discovers anything about himself during his dozens of hours or hundreds of years in the time loop. And I think that's what I want in a story like this. What did they learn about themselves? What did they discover? What did... <laughs> oh boy! Here we go. 12 minutes. It's another time loop game that came out in 2021 and like Deathloop, also focuses on nailing a specific sequence of events. Unlike Deathloop, the loop of 12 minutes takes place over somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes, can't remember, and it's in some ways a much more grounded story, centered on one apartment and only three characters. Conceptually, I really like 12 minutes, because it plays into something I've pondered myself. If I gave myself an absurd goal to accomplish within a day, but was able to try over and over and over again, could I do it? Let's say I wanted, within 24 hours, to get a meeting in the Oval Office. Is there an exact series of words I could say, calls I could make, events I could cause, that would result in it? It's like a combination of monkeys banging on typewriters and the butterfly effect. Eventually, by trying enough different things, where could I end up? 12 minutes doesn't have you talk your way into the White House, but it does pose an almost equally absurd problem. Can you both avoid a violent cop and solve a years-old murder without ever leaving your apartment and within 12 minutes? Fair warning, I'm gonna spoil some parts of this one, and double fair warning, it may be more entertaining to hear this game talked about than actually play it. Let's go. So, if you don't do anything at all, the loop of 12 minutes goes like this. You're a dude who comes home, greets your wife, starts a romantic dinner where she tells you she's pregnant, then a guy who claims to be a cop breaks down the door, handcuffs both of you, yells at the wife that she's under arrest for murder, and chokes you out. Then the evening starts again. Right off the bat, there's a lot of stuff you can try. You can try and convince your wife that you're in a time loop. Some claims are more effective than others. What would really convince someone that you know what's going to happen? You can try and fight off the cop with a kitchen knife or something, but he will virtually always overpower you. But like in Deathloop, there's a feeling of consequencelessness that sets in as you loop over and over and over again. And so the things you try start to get more extreme. One of the earlier moves you can try, one that I think is actually required for progression, is just to hide for the whole time. Don't let your wife see you get home, hide in the closet, let the cop come and attack her and pry some previously unheard info from her, and then shoot her. You can just hide for the whole thing. And although on some level I felt bad about letting my wife get murdered just to see what would happen, the fact that I did get some new data to use in my next loop was a lesson to me. I internalized that I wouldn't be able to predict what scenarios would provide information and what wouldn't, so I just started trying everything. Like a monkey on the butterfly effect typewriter, I pushed the buttons at random. What if I eat my dessert before dinner starts? Nothing. What if I go in the bedroom and turn off the lights? Nothing. What if I stab myself? Nothing. What if I stab my wife? Nothing. What if I take sleeping pills? I fall asleep, then nothing. What if unbeknownst to her, I give my wife sleeping pills? Well... I'm not sure if this is the intended way to play 12 minutes, but it sure feels like the way most people end up playing it. And as the game kept repeating and solutions didn't present themselves, any sense of ethics was the first thing to go. I didn't stab my wife because I hated her or thought she was evil, I stabbed her because I was out of other things to try. 12 minutes isn't as inherently gamey as Deathloop, there's no button to kick dudes off cliffs, you're not shown how to kill in the tutorial. In many ways, it feels like it takes death more seriously or at least the actors sell it more, you believe that it's hard for the protagonist to do the horrible things you direct him to do. At least the first time. 
but you do them anyway, and they escalate from druggings to torture to more. Eventually, you find out some truly heinous shit about yourself and your past. By trying every combination of things in this apartment, I unlocked repressed memories. Whoops. And then, the end of the game basically asks you to decide what you're going to do with these now unlocked horrors. You want to keep living your life? You want to run away? You want to just forget it all? But my question, and I'm now starting to feel like I'm in a time loop of my own, is what is this character going to do with all the present horrors, the ones he just did? How do the memories of all the near mindless stabbings, druggings, tortures follow him into the real world? Unlike Colt, this guy didn't seem to find any pleasure in all this violence, but he did it all the same. Feels like no matter what happens next, he should be profoundly affected by this. But we don't see it. Because once again, the story assumes that the actions he and we take mid-loop are consequenceless, and so they won't make an impact. And I just don't think that's an assumption we can make. I don't know. I recognize this topic is kind of impossible, because, you know, time loops don't exist. They're a brilliant fictional device because they're so good at revealing all the aspects of a character they might keep under wraps in the normal world. But I've felt silly several times writing this, spending so much time thinking about the ramifications of a situation that none of us will ever face. We can't hit the reset switch on harm we cause others or learn the perfect route through a difficult situation. Maybe there's an argument to be made that people who are almost entirely sheltered from the consequences of their own actions, royalty and the mega rich, do often end up acting in a, the ways you might if no one's life mattered. But then, their decisions and even their lives that mean things. They can't descend into true time loop nihilism. I think the reason I'm frustrated with the lack of self-reflection to accompany the violence in these stories is I actually have seen it done before. I've seen it done unbelievably well. In Nanakwame Ajay Brenia's short story Through the Flash, we meet a character who's essentially lived through Deathloop, lived an incalculable amount of time as someone like Colt or Juliana, and then had to keep going. Let me set up the story a little bit. So, in Through the Flash, our main character is a 14-year-old girl named Ama, though that's a bit misleading. She's been 14 for, at this point, thousands of years. Unsurprisingly, if you've been paying even a little attention to this video, Ama is stuck in a time loop. Actually, her whole town is. At the end of the day is The Flash. The town is essentially nuked. And then the same day starts again. She says in the early days of the loop, the whole town would gather to watch The Flash together. At the beginning, they would have a party when someone woke up, meaning they realized they were in a loop. And then the beginning ended, and the days stretched into the near infinite, and Ama made the same decision we make the second we boot up Deathloop. I'm going to use this loop to become the best murderer I possibly can. There's a several hundred year period where Ama is to herself and to the town Knife Queen. Like anyone who's ever met a middle schooler knows, the power of a 14 year old is terrifying. She says, I use my body better than anyone. I can jump Olympic. I can break grown men with my bare hands. I could kill all 116 people on my cluster in one hour and 22 minutes. I take a shower and change halfway through because my clothes got so heavy. She promises that whatever the worst thing you can imagine is, she's done it to everyone more than once. I'm not going to read the worst things described in this story because even for our gamer desensitized brains, it's a lot. Ama even had her own antagonist, the Juliana to her cult, or the inverse, a boy named Carl, who she hunted for years and who often returned the favor. They each perpetrated unwritable horrors on each other. But in Through the Flash, there's nothing anyone can work towards, no breaking of the loop or solving the mystery. That repeated day just becomes life. The things Ama does to other people becomes who she is. And so, after hundreds of years, she decides she's not going to be Knife Queen anymore. Instead adopts mantras about everyone being supreme, being infinite, and I think she mostly believes it. But it's not like her past is gone. 
She still thinks about what it felt like after she had murdered everyone on the block. She could be alone and feel like no one could hurt her ever again. She still sees Carl and thinks about the time she fed She has a conversation with her neighbor, an old woman named Mrs. Nagel, where Ama confesses that she's worried she liked the old me better, that it was easier. Mrs. Nagel gently pushes her, asks if it really was a different person, an old Ama that did all the torturing and killing. Ama says, the old me did everything one way and only thought about one person. Now I try to help everybody instead of killing them. I used to be afraid. I know I can't take it back. I know I'm the worst person who ever lived. I know that. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm only scared of me. Mrs. Nagel asks again if that means Ama's been two different people, and in that moment, Ama pictures crushing Mrs. Nagel's neck like crumpling a piece of paper. But she doesn't. How can you not see the difference, Ama says. I'm so much better now. I am. And Mrs. Nagel says, I think you've done a fine job. And it's true that in the past you were a terrible witch, but I think there's only one Ama, and I think I'm talking to her. Through the Flash, unlike Deathloop, unlike 12 Minutes, is a story about how your actions create an impression upon you always. Even if no one else remembers it or yesterday is the same as tomorrow, being a person who performs great violence or cruelty means you are a person capable of performing great violence or cruelty. Time loops are machines for introspection. Colt will not instantly become a new person if he breaks the loop. 12 minutes protagonist remains someone who did everything the game entailed, no matter the conclusion. The beauty of Through the Flash is that it acknowledges this, knows there's no such thing as consequenceless actions, and yet shows that you can work to get better regardless. No matter how many times the sun rises, no matter if it's the same sunrise or a new one, it's you. It's you. It's you. There's the story about the very first production of the play Death of a Salesman in 1949. The last line of the play is said, the curtain comes down, silence. The audience doesn't clap or boo or even move, but there are men in their seats that are just helpless. They have handkerchiefs over their faces and eventually someone starts clapping and then everyone claps and the actors bow and things look like they should the end of a play. But there are these men who are still crying, and they can't stop. Some switch has been flipped, something's been released, and it can't be pulled back in. Doctors are called to the theater, the men are taken to the hospital, they just can't stop crying. This is a story that's taken up space in my brain for years. On one hand, it's deeply sad, obviously. You ever seen your dad cry? This is like a whole theater of your dad crying, advanced levels of sad. On the other hand, it's, it's a little funny. Like in an absolutely pitch black sense, I'm talking Twin Peaks funeral level, maybe just laughing because we don't quite know how to deal with the emotions in front of us. It's an intensely weird thing to imagine happening. And on a, a third hand, it is really a story about what a megaton death of a salesman was in 1949, because what else could have caused this sort of reaction? Let's talk about the play and give some context, just in case you slept through this part of English class. Death of a Salesman is probably one of the most famous pieces of American literature of the past 
I don't know, lifespan of America. Like I said, it was originally staged on Broadway in 1949. It's been revived for Broadway four times since then, most recently in 2012. It's also been produced like a billion more times for every regional theater and community production and high school showcase. Its author, Arthur Miller, is similarly one of the most influential playwrights in American history. And although he wrote over two dozen plays, Death of a Salesman is right up there at the top. Maybe sharing space with The Crucible, another play you may or may not have slept through. The story of Death of a Salesman follows Willie Loman, an aging man who does sales. We never find out what he sells, nor does it really matter. Willie has these grand ideas of what a salesman is, what the profession represents, a, a prosperous man, well-liked, known. The problem is, of course, Willie is none of these things. It's not that he's achieved nothing. He's married, owns a house, has two kids. But at 63, he can't come to grips with the idea that he is going to continue aging and eventually die without ever achieving whatever he feels he ought to. This manifests in near constant delusions. Willie lies to his family and himself about how respected he is and how much money he makes. He keeps himself going in a vain attempt to return to glory days that he never really had. And most damaging of all, he imparts these expectations and pressures onto his son, Biff. Biff Loman, clearly Willie's favorite child, was a high school himbo and football star, and then did what most people who play football in high school do. He just became a guy. He did odd jobs, worked on a farm, bounced between places. None of this is particularly damning. He just wasn't an office guy. Seems like he would have lived a totally normal life, oh, wow. except for Willie's insurmountable expectations in the potential success of his son. Willie constantly tells Biff about all the business he should be succeeding in. If only he'd put his mind to it. And Biff believes him because Willie has been telling the same lies about himself his whole life. What Biff is left with then is a spiral of guilt and disappointment, never able to become the man his father wants him to be. The same spiral his father is living in his own life, fittingly enough. In the middle of the play, we find out that Willie has been trying to kill himself. At the end of the play, he does. Just before, as delusional as he's ever been, Willie fantasizes about all the people from all the towns that will come to the funeral, showing once and for all to his family that he was known, that his life meant something. He's also delighted that the money from his life insurance policy can go to Biff, which he can finally use to invest in a business and really become someone. Neither of these happen. Willie's funeral is almost completely unattended, and his sons are as lost as they've ever been. Obviously, this struck a nerve in 1949. The ideas in the play of Willie's failure as a businessman, his sons growing up to be no greater than him, the fact that the world doesn't care about someone who's just ordinary. Newspapers wrote about the play with headlines like Tragedy of the Ordinary Man. Willie is tragic as an individual, but he's tragic as a symbol too. You can imagine the unsuspecting audiences of those first showings dumbstruck by a representation of their unspoken repressed fears. That the American dream was a lie, or evolving faster than they were, or simply out of their reach. The idea that they wouldn't be able to give a better life to their children. There were some that viewed the themes of Death of a Salesman as so electric, so infectious, that it posed a threat to America. It's not hard to read the play as a profoundly anti-capitalist piece of art. The story only works, the characters only make sense because we're already familiar with the crushing expectations and callous indifference of the system we live in. Written by the communist adjacent and also very Jewish Arthur Miller and released in the early years of the Red Scare, Death of a Salesman was construed as dangerously subversive by 
some institutional actors. Mm -hmm. In fact, well. for a 1951 film version of the play, Columbia Pictures attempted to slap a pre-movie short called Career of a Salesman onto every showing, a short that reassured audiences that the film they're about to see, full of tragedy and dread, has nothing to do with the modern salesman, who's instead full of vim and vigor and presumably never faces the least bit of existential despair. <laughs> it was never released, partially because Miller refused to sign off. He said, I was being asked to concur that death of a salesman was morally meaningless, a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing. But its mere existence indicates the electricity of the ideas in the play. Something in this work touched people, spelled out anxieties in a way so powerful that, I don't know, what if it convinced people to dismantle capitalism? Spoilers, it did not. But this scale of reaction is the reason I started with that story of the men who couldn't stop crying. It's such a perfect encapsulation of the lightning bolt that was this play, almost unbearably poignant debilitatingly bright. The thing is, that story about the men crying, the sources for this information are, well, they're mixed. The first part about the audience's silence after the curtain came down comes from Arthur Miller himself. He told The New Yorker about that exact series of events in 1999 and is about as primary a source as you could hope for. He was an 84-year-old man talking about something that happened 50 years previous, but still, if we can't trust his account, then we've got nothing. The second part, the men who couldn't stop crying is... Okay, the first place I heard about it was uh, from my theater teacher when I was a junior in high school. She is rad as hell and absolutely knew how to impress the importance of a play onto a group of teenagers, but, you know, she wasn't there. There's another person who's recounted this story, though, Mike Nichols, the man who directed the 2012 Broadway revival of Salesman, as well as The Graduate and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. He's a big director. And he did actually see the original production. He was there in 1949, and he said, there were fathers for whom the doctor had to be called because they couldn't stop crying all night. Case closed. Okay, not actually. Nichols says he went to the production in 1949, but he also says he doesn't really remember it. He would have been 18 at the time. And his full quote is actually, if you went to a progressive school in New York, a private school like I did, it was a big deal. There were stories about fathers for whom the doctors had to be called because they couldn't stop crying all night. It was kind of a legend it was so clearly a great play. And that's, that's less conclusive. That's not a first hound account. That's another person talking about a story he heard. Although he did give that interview after my theater teacher told me the same story. So like, she didn't hear it from him, at least. They both independently heard it, which makes it more possibly true. I guess it's not uncommon for tall tales to spring up around art with this kind of energy. Here's one of mine. I saw Gone Girl in a packed theater of college students. It's one of the most fun movie experiences I can remember. When I tell people about this, which I've done several times because my life isn't that exciting, I say that at the climactic Neil Patrick Harris box cutter scene, the whole audience was screaming. That's not really true. A lot of people gasped and there were definitely some whoops, but what I'm trying to communicate with my hyperbole is there was some absolutely wild energy in that theater at that scene. A whole lot of people were feeling a whole lot right then. Doesn't really give the vibes I'm looking for, so the whole theater was screaming. I'm a liar, you caught me. There's a more interesting version of this though, one that's worked its way into film history. Everyone knows what I'm going to say. Let's say it together. La rive d'un train and got de la ciutat. Of course. So, here's the story. 
the year is 1896. Film is new, like really new, and there are these hot young brothers on the scene, the Lumiere brothers. They've shown a couple films already, and by films I mean literally just things that are filmed previously. Their smash hit was Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory, a recording of workers walking out of a factory. But in January of 1896, they did a public showing of La Rive d'un Train, or the arrival of a train at La Ciotat Station, and this is what becomes the stuff of legend. So the film itself is, well, it's pretty well described by the title. There is a train, and it pulls into a station, slowing to a stop, and then various people walk around and get on and off the train. It's about 50 seconds long. We watch it now and have the appropriate reaction, which is, hey, Trains are pretty neat. But in the original screening in 1896, the audience had a different reaction. The train draws closer, closer to the screen, and it's not slowing down. In fact, it's speeding up. Someone in the audience screams. They jump to their feet. The train is going to crash into them. Suddenly, the theater becomes a stampede. People running and jumping, attempting to get out of the way before the train crushes them beneath its wheels. The power of cinema! This is an incredibly fun story for several reasons. First off, it gives us the chance to uh, condescend towards people a century ago, which we all love to do. If I was present at the invention of cinema, I would have simply recognized the separation between reality and pre-recorded images. But at the same time, that awe and terror the audience displays is satisfying. Sometimes I daydream about getting in a time machine and like showing the recent Spider-Man game to an arcade crowd in 1980 or something. I would hope their reaction would be as over the top as an audience running from a human train. But I think the primary reason the story has stuck around is it reinforces the power of film. From our position in the 21st century, when video is the predominant form of entertainment, news, how to learn new dances, it's clear that this technology radically changed the world. We want to hear that the arrival of film was like a bolt of lightning, earth-shaking, literally something that causes people to leap out of their seats. In the 2011 movie Hugo, a movie completely obsessed with the legacy and power of old Hollywood, there's a scene where a train smashes fleeing through the station, nearly running over dozens of people who scramble out of the way. Hugo's train scene is a number of things. One, a bombastic demonstration of how far technology has come. Two, an attempt to parallel the arrival of a real 3D, Hugo was a, a big 3D movie, with the arrival of film as a medium. And three, just to pay tribute to this foundational part of movie history. If there's one thing Marty loves, it's preserving cinema, remembering the past, paying tribute to the people who laid the rails we're still following today. Which makes it all the more interesting that you may have seen this coming. The panicked reaction to La Rive d'un Train and Gare de la Ciutat almost certainly never happened. In an absolute banger of an article called Cinema's Founding Myth, author Marianne Leuperdinger goes through step by step everything we know about Lumiere's train screenings. He considers factors from the theater's architecture to contemporaneous police reports to newspaper articles of the day. Nothing implies there was even a momentary terrified reaction. However, by highlighting passages written about the train by journalists and scholars, Leuperdinger is able to triangulate where this myth would have grown from. In 1896, Felix Regnault wrote, We repeat what has often been said about the nature and life of the scenes that Lumiere presents us. The beer foams that the waiter at the coffee house pours, and the glasses are emptied when the men drink. The locomotive appears small at first, then immense, as if it were going to crush the audience. One has the impression of depth and relief, even though it is a single image that unfolds before our eyes. And the same year, a Russian journalist named Maxim Gorky is maybe the most explicit of all. In July of 1896, he wrote, A train appears on the screen. It speeds right at you. Watch out! 
It seems as though it will plunge into the darkness in which you sit, turning you into a ripped sack full of lacerated flesh and splintered bones and crushing into dust and into broken fragments this hall and this building so full of women, wine, music, and vice. A compelling description, almost one to one with the myth we're familiar with. But then he continues, but this too is but a train of shadows. Noiselessly, the locomotive disappears beyond the edge of the screen. The train comes to a stop and gray figures silently emerge from the cars, soundlessly greet their friends, laugh, walk, run, bustle, and are gone. The common link between all these descriptions isn't an actual fear of being run down, but a turn to that language because of an inability to otherwise describe the sensation of watching this film. In a way, it's disappointing to learn that this foundational cinematic experience was an analogy, not a literal accounting of events, but a more charitable take recognizes that it's still pretty remarkable that many independent writers wrote about La Rive d'un Crane using this same language. Despite the lack of an audience stampede, I don't think it's unreasonable to describe the experience of seeing this early film as an encounter with the fantastic, almost supernatural. Hoiberdinger describes it as hyper-realism, not just a simple depiction of life, that the audience's reaction wasn't panic, but still, in a way, a brush with something indescribable. Comical fleeing from the big filmed train sticks around because well, because we can describe that. There is, as with everything, also a layer of politics under all this. As soon as five years after the arrival of a train, there were new films like The Countryman and The Cinematograph, which depicted a, let's say, bumpkin, comedically terrified by a film of a train. Running alongside the story of the magic of early film screenings is another narrative, one of the susceptibility of common often lower class people to unfamiliar technology. The most famous instance of this isn't on film, but radio. Orson Welles' 1938 radio play of War of the Worlds. And since you've made it this far and likely know this video's game by now, I'll tell you, everything is not as you've heard about the reaction to this play. So once again, let's start with a legend. It's October 30th, 1938, you know, the day before Halloween. Orson Welles and a team at the Mercury Theater have decided to put on a radio play, an adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel, War of the Worlds. But their adaptation is a little different, a little more exciting. It's designed to sound like a series of breaking news bulletins, urgent reports cutting off the evening's pre-planned programming. And it's important to note Wells and company did say, did clearly say, that they were presenting a play. In the War of the World by H.G. Wells. But it's radio. So if you happen to, I don't know, get bored and switch to this station somewhere in the middle of the program, you wouldn't have heard an announcement that you were listening to a play. You might have heard something like this. Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Now the whole field's caught up by the woods. Of in the play, Scientists observe explosions on Mars, then a strange object falls on a farm, then aliens come out of the object and use a heat ray on bystanders, and then a series of news updates detail the aliens landing and wreaking havoc around the country. The military can't stop it. They're releasing poison smoke around New York. And then the broadcast goes silent. And it picks back up. The more typical radio play following one guy wandering around post-invasion trying to survive until, like in the book, the aliens are eventually killed by microbes in the Earth's atmosphere. No one really talks about the second half, though. Here's some important context. This was in 1938, a somewhat tumultuous time in history, and one in which real news bulletins would often interrupt whatever was currently playing on the radio. Americans had been hearing these really scary breaking news segments from Europe, basically tracking what would become World War II less than a year later. If you were listening to the radio, 
and you heard one of these, we interrupt our program to bring you a special broadcast type deals, you were primed to hear some heavy stuff. So, even though War of the Worlds was a well-known entertainment property, and even though they announced that it was fiction at the beginning of the show, and even though the sequence of events is improbably, hilariously condensed from explosions on Mars to the full takeover of the United States within 30 minutes, people thought it was real. Switchboards lit up. Thousands of people were calling the police department. People needed to know if they should get in bunkers or on the roof. People reported seeing smoke or even machines coming over the skyline. The panic was reported on across the country. Radio play terrifies nation. Fake radio war stirs terror through US. Newspapers really latched onto the story, amping up its infamy until Looking back now, it almost seems like it was some Purge-esque night. People running, screaming through the streets, convinced that they were moments away from being wiped out. Weeks later, a newspaper survey would estimate that millions of people were listening to the show, and almost one in 12 of them thought it was real. The legend of War of the Worlds radio broadcast grows, demonstrating everything from the gullibility of the nation, to the power of radio, to the pre-war fears gripping America. And let me say, some of this definitely happened. We have interviews with switchboard operators, for instance, who got many calls related to the program. But in terms of the immediate impact on the population, well, I like this analogy Professor Michael Sokolow used on Radiolab. Let me give you an analogy, okay? If you were to ask 100 Americans today, did you see a plane fly into the World Trade Center on September 11th? I think you would get an extremely high percentage of people saying they saw that plane flying. But that's because it's part of our national visual memory. It's really a trauma, and it's, it's, it's the kind of hysteria and panic we're talking about. It's that moment in time in our relationship to the media, okay? But if you were to actually find out whose TVs were on live at 9.48 in the morning that day, and who was actually watching, there would be a discrepancy in that number. Now, am I saying all those people are lying? All those people are confused? No, what I'm saying is that the relationship of memory to the media is extremely complex. I mentioned the survey done weeks later, where millions of people said they were listening. There was actually also a survey done that night, the night the radio play aired. 5,000 Americans were asked more than enough to get a statistically significant answer, and of those surveyed, only 2% said they were listening to War of the Worlds. And of that 2%, none said they were listening to a news broadcast. What Sokolow and many other media scholars have theorized is that the reports of panic from War of the Worlds were exaggerated by newspapers who had an ongoing feud with the relatively new medium of radio news. By painting radio as a dangerous form of communication, one in which pranksters like Wells could cause national panics, newspapers could establish that they were still the true, reliable sources. And to them both, I say podcasts will be the death of you all. The fascinating thing about the War of the World broadcast is Despite the original's inflated mythic quality, there have been rebroadcasts of the play, and these have also caused panic. There was one in 1968 in Buffalo, New York, that despite repeating several times that it was fiction, still resulted in thousands of phone calls. There was a performance of it in Quito, Ecuador in 1949 that resulted in actual military deployment and deaths, although the deaths were after the listeners realized that they were being tricked by the radio station. Because the legend of War of the Worlds has more obvious political machinations behind its existence than death of a salesman or a train arriving at a station, it's harder to unravel how people felt about it as, you know, as art. But I think the idea of helplessly hearing about something terrifying, something life-altering over the radio, hearing about events that will change the course of history, and being unable to act on them in any way, is as frightening as it's ever been. 
1938, the radio was reporting on sparks that would lead to World War II. In 1968, people would have been hearing about the atrocities of Vietnam, both real and awful.